Of course, the Orioles wrapped up the first half of the season yesterday. We all know how much we enjoy listening to this man on Mass, and the rest of the country got to enjoy him on Roku. He is the great Ben McDonald, and he is back with us now on GCR. Ben, it's Glenn. It's always good to catch up, man. Thank you for taking the time for us today. Yeah, man, my pleasure. Always enjoy talking to you. Dude, I am. Uh, I know that like what really matters is that the Orioles are in first place and that for the most part things have gone really well. But we, it feels like at the moment it's harder to hide from some of the more glaring problems that could continue to linger for this team. Um, and I feel like it starts with the starting pitching, right? Yeah, look, I don't disagree. You know, it's uh, it, it, if you take it into this totality, the first half, it was a hell of a first half. If I, you know, I think going into spring training, if we just said, hey, if we'd be one game in front of the AL East at the All Star break, I think everybody would have taken it. Uh, what's what's a little bit alarming is the way we kind of limped down the stretch in the second half. That's alarming in some ways, you know. And and look, I think a lot of it's just right off of the game of baseball. I mean, it's. It's very rare that everything goes bad at the same time, but that almost feels like what happened. I mean, the Orioles pitching was unbelievable. The offense was the best in baseball for most of the uh, of the first half. And all of a sudden, when it stopped, man, it's just like somebody turned the water faucet off. It, it dried up, you know, and the offense just went down in a hurry. The pitchers had some rough outings mixed in there. And so it kind of all hit at the same time, which is really weird, you know. So I'm hoping this – uh, for me, the, the win yesterday is the, by far the biggest win of the year. It's not even mm-hmm. close. Mm-hmm. And I, I think this gives you some momentum going to the second half. It makes you feel good about going into your break a little bit to know that, okay, we, we did win the final game. We still have one game in front of the first place. Now we got to kind of hit the reset a little bit and recharge the batteries and get rolling for the second half of the season. I, I really think there's going to be some moves that are going to be made. I think Mike Elias is out beating the bushes big time. I don't think it's going to happen until late when more teams jump in. Uh, and be sellers when we know what's going to happen. But I think I think Mike realizes where the needs are. He obviously has the pulse of this team, and he knows that he's going to go. He's going to make the moves he feels like is going to benefit this team, no doubt. Let me cover a couple things you said there because I'll start with the like. I feel like for the offense, and we know that obviously over the course of what scoring like four runs or two runs over four games, it, it was a problem. Um, is that as simple as, because I do believe that that can be more of a, hey, get back from the All-Star break, everything's fine. Are you confident that like the struggles late in the first half that we saw from Adley, Gunner, things like that, that that just gets fixed by, get them a little bit of a break, they'll be all right on the other side of the All-Star break? Yeah, look, I, I, I hate to make excuses, but I will say this. I mean, that run that the Orioles had played, what, 30 games in 31 days in June, and then you go out to the West Coast for a, you know a pretty long trip out there. You get back at three o'clock in the morning. You get a homestand. It's it's not an excuse because everybody does it. But I'll tell you this: it doesn't always show up right away. Sometimes it's a week later that it jumps on your back a little bit. These are the dog days of summer. The Orioles have played a lot. They're banged up right now. And look, I I don't want to judge them on a the sample size. And if I look at the last two weeks, I think it's more of a sample size right. than just judging them on the the entirety of the season. So if a team has been a really good team, and the Orioles have been one of the best teams in baseball for a longer period, and then they struggle a little bit. I, I'm still going to lean on, on this is who I think they are. I think they're a really good ball team. I just think they're going through a rough spot. And look, all you got to do is look right across the way to the Yankees. The Yankees got off to the best part out of anybody, and yet they've not been great as of late either. You know, so look, it happens to everybody. Somebody said the other day, look, the 1983. World Series champion Baltimore Orioles had two seven-game losing streaks mixed in in that run that they did. So. Look, I would rather struggle now than I would like we did last year, limping into the playoffs. I felt like I could see our offense going south last year. We got to the playoffs. I'd rather have those struggles now. I'd rather the players go through this tough time right now, hit the reset button a little bit, and finish really strong down the stretch. Because we, as we know, it's all about how you're playing when the playoffs get here. We saw the Texas Rangers make that run. We saw the Diamondbacks make that run. We saw the three best teams in baseball not even get out of the first round of the playoffs. You know, when you talk about the Braves, the Dodgers, and the Orioles last year. So you don't know what to expect. The only thing you can hope is you're peaking at the right time when the playoffs come around. Ben McDonald with us here on GCR. Ben, uh, to the pitching for a second, because I agree with you that I, I think it's it's obvious that there will be moves made. Outside of Corbin Burns and Grayson Rodriguez at the moment, it's very difficult for Orioles fans to feel trust that any of the other starters that they have thrown out in the last few weeks – are guys that you could trust in a playoff game. And that's not to take anything away from things that, you know, individually Dean Kramer's done or Albert Suarez, who's been... Is there one of those guys that you look at and say, I, I, not, you know, you do the Lee Corso, they're not so fast, my friend. Is there one of those guys in that group 
that you still just looking at their stuff, that maybe the numbers don't define it, that you believe really could be a story come the playoffs from that group? Yeah, I mean, listen, it, Dean Kramer is the guy that proved last year. And, and look, he's got to be going well, like, like a lot of guys are going well. But, I mean, I'll take you back. Dean had a heck of a year last year. He showed me a lot. I mean, he won 13 games, went 13 and 5 through a lot of innings last year. I think, if he, remember, this is only his third start coming back from a tricep injury. I don't think he's ramped up all the way and quite comfortable with his mechanics. I, I could see a guy that typically finishes strong down the stretch. He's normally in great shape. His workout programs in the offseason are good. He normally is a second-half pitcher that can really go out and go for a while. And so I, I think if he gets right, and I don't think he's right yet, I think he could be a factor in that. Having said that, I mean, look, if I have my choices, if I'm Mike Elias, I'm going to get somebody that's going to that's right. going to slot in right behind Grayson Rodriguez and right behind Corbin Burns. I need a guy like that. You know, that's the kind of guy that I'm honestly looking for. And Dean Kramer becomes maybe my four-starter or he becomes a bullpen piece or something. But if I'm looking at this and trying to win the World Series this year, i got to go get not just a starting pitcher. It's got to be a top three starting pitcher. And here's the other piece of that, as you guys know. It has to be a pitcher that's got some club control because – Yep. You talked about next year. Yep. And as you look at next year, there's not a whole lot of starting pitchers under club control. So if I'm Mike Elias, and look, this is hard to do. I got to have a guy for this year, but I, that guy needs to be a guy that's got club control because I got to fill out my rotation for next year, too. So you got to have an eye on 2025 as well. And that's when it becomes very difficult. So uh, let me, let me, just if I could for a second, Ben, I, I, I am, because I, everything that you've just said, I utterly and completely agree with. Is, is there someone that you, that like, to fit, because everybody talks about like Garrett Crochet and then you worry about the innings thing. Is there someone, obviously not knowing what the cost would be, but that you look out on the landscape of teams that might be in the trade market that you say, this to me would be the guy that would make perfect sense to me? You know who I like, and I, I think he's under club control with the Toronto Blue Jays. It looks like, obviously, they're going to be sellers in this. I like Chris Bassett. Yeah. I think Chris Bassett has been around. He's pitching the playoffs. He's a veteran guy that's had two of his best couple of years the last couple of years. I think he's got two more years of team control left. I like a guy like that. I think he really slots in as a real number three. Uh, maybe it won't kill your prospect list to go get him. Right. Uh, and I think he'd be a big piece, you know. Uh I mean, look, Crochet is intriguing to me, but if I go get Crochet, I would have to put him in the bullpen this year, which I wouldn't right. mind doing that because I need a bullpen no piece doubt. too. No doubt. And then, and then next year I can hit the ground running with him, you know, and he would be a starter for next year. So, look, I love that move too. I can live with that move. I mean, if you go get – and that's a big ask, right? I mean, you go get Crochet and Bassett, that's a big ask. But that's that might be what it takes if you're really – now. Having said that, I, I'm not saying that what the Orioles have right now can't win the World Series. It sure. can. It, there's no doubt these pieces could. But what scares me now is we're very thin. Like if another starter goes down or another reliever goes down, it really worries me at that point. We're, what do you do at that point? And that's why I think we need one of each just for more than anything, just for insurance policies, kind of, if you will, in case there is another injury late in the year. No, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, ben McDonald with us on GCR. I want to go back to Grayson for a second, if I could, because it still seems like every fourth or fifth start, you know, we see kind of what happened over the weekend. And I, Grayson's great, and Grayson is obviously in the group of guys that you trust. But then right now, what's the difference between Grayson Rodriguez being a reliable major league pitcher versus taking that next step to perhaps be the in a post Corbin Burns world? the ace of the Orioles staff that we've believed talent-wise he's capable of being? Yeah, look, I mean, when, when you look at Grayson Rodriguez, it, it just screams number one, dude. Like, yeah. he's, a, he's an ace. He's a number one. And look, honestly, he has pitched like that. I, I, before his last start, I went back and looked. He had 29 starts going back to the All-Star break last year. He, 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 had, he was 16-5 and five in those 29 starts with a 3.1 ERA. Yeah. That is number one type numbers. There's no doubt about that. The only thing Grayson Rodriguez is missing right now is more experience. That's all he's missing. You know, I mean, you look, he's got, he's got about 220 big league innings right now. That's all he's got, man. And so he's still learning a, a lot of different ways every time he goes out. And he'll learn how to minimize damage because when he has his A game and the changeup is working with that big fastball, he shuts guys down like he just shoves it, you know. And then – there's going to be times like the other day where he's got to learn how to minimize damage. And minimizing damage comes with mound time, innings, starts, all those things, years of experience. And so for me, I just keep running Grayson Rodriguez out there every fifth or sixth day. I just keep 
teaching him along the way, learning with him along the way, and just plugging him in. I mean, the innings begin to mount the years go by. Grace Rodriguez is going to be a real number one. I'm just telling you, we just got to keep him healthy and keep running him out. Uh, there. Well, you can see it. There's no doubt about that part of it. All right, Ben McDonald, I know you you had been talking up Vance Honeycutt. We had heard you talking about him on the broadcast yeah. so late. Uh, what should we know? We, we obviously, you know, the, the reputation is all of the tools are great. There's too much swing and miss. Um, what should we know? What have you seen? Why were you so high on the idea of Vance Honeycutt, who the Orioles took with the 22nd pick? I saw Vance last year that I saw him at the College World Series and did three of his games this year. And I'm going to tell you what, he um, he's a real deal, in my opinion. Yes, there is some swing and miss there. Yes, that is the reason why he fell to 22, because if there wasn't as much swing and miss there, Vance Honeycutt, for me, goes inside the top 10 or 12 picks Man. in the first round. But because there is some swing and miss there, he fell to where he was. But when you talk about athleticism, he's a big guy that can – I mean. You know, we talk about Enrique Bradfield Jr. and the way he can run and defend. This kid's right there with him. I mean, he can really go. I think he was the ACC a Defensive Player of the Year back-to-back years. Um, I saw him get some giant base hits. If you go back and look at their postseason, man, down the stretch, he had, I want to say, four walk-off base hits or and or home runs uh, just in the postseason alone for North Carolina. He came up big when, it, when the lights got the brightest and the stage got the biggest, man. He was special. And so – there's a lot of pop there. I mean, 28 homers, 28 RBIs he can run. I think it's a, the uncertainty is the swing and miss piece, you know. But uh, I'm with Matt Blood and Mike Elias on this. I Honestly, I did not think Vance Honeycutt would last to 22. I thought he'd be gone and off the table. Uh, but it's nice that he did. And I'll tell you, the order's got him a real dude. He's a real dude. that has got to clean it up a little bit with the swing and miss. But if he does – but here's the thing for me. The floor for him – is a fourth outfielder at the big league level. Sure. He's a big leaguer all day long. That's, that's the floor. The ceiling, if he can hit a little bit, is an everyday center fielder because there's a lot of kids that come out and play center field in college that can't stick in center field right. at the big league level or in pro ball. He can stick, man. He can stick in center field. And so uh, this is going to be a fun one to watch. I think I think the Orioles got, got him a good one on, with, with this kid. I love that. Before we let you go, Ben, um, you know, it, it feels like we're kind of on the cusp again of, of a couple of guys, right? The Kobe Mayos of the world and maybe a Jackson Holiday return, but it's tough because it, it, nobody's just going to create room for you. I, how close are we getting to the point of the Orioles maybe having to make an awkward decision about a veteran and saying, look, we love you and we are appreciative of everything that you've done, but – I, we it might just be time whether it's Ramon Arias you know I, I I just don't know how close we might be to maybe that having to be the case because these guys just appear so ready to be at the major league level yeah look I, I honestly thought that we may see Kobe Mayo yesterday wow. I thought that with Rodon on the mound and you got Natoli down there who pitched you could have sent him back you could have brought up an extra position player for one game I really thought Mayo was coming honestly yes they just inject a little bit of spark in this offense you know then maybe you send him back down or if he went three for four maybe he gets to stay a little bit longer you know but the way Mike Elias talked the other day Kobe Mayo's knocking and he's been knocking for a while you know and the, the numbers don't lie uh he's pretty much accomplished they keep saying well we got to clean him up at third base and look they do. I mean, he's got to get better if he's going to play big league third base. If that's going to be his real spot. But he took a giant step forward, you know, from last year to this year. So that that's a positive sign. But you can always plug him in at DH and at first base. He can play third. He might even be able to go to a corner spot in the outfield as well. But I think, look, uh, honestly, I think a lot's going to depend on the first road trip of the year after the All-Star break. If this offense continues to sputter, I think Michael Elias is going to go and say, okay, I got I got to do something. I got to inject one of my young prospects in here. I got to try to light this fire and get it going again, you know. And I so I think that's what's going what you're going to see. The Orioles start off in Texas and they go to Miami. If this offense is sputtering, I, I'm saying Kobe Mayo comes pretty quick. And from what I hear, Jackson Holiday starting to swing that much better as well, which is a great sign. So there'll be some options along with some trade pieces. I think at some point in time here, in the next you know two or three weeks, and we'll see what happens. Uh, well, how you spending your All Star break? You know, I got home late, late last night, so I'm going to hang out here and um, uh, go up to the farm and cut some grass and do some things and relax a little bit in this, in this uh, warm weather we got down here in the Baton Rouge area. And, and I'm going to head back to Miami, and uh, I'll, I'll have the games in Miami after, after the boys leave Texas, so that'd be fun. Sounds pretty good to me. Ben McDonald, always appreciate you. Enjoyed you and Jeff. That was fun with you and Jeff and uh, reliving uh, 
Brawls Pass. That was a fun way to spend a Sunday morning, man. That was a really fun. Yeah, that was a, that was a good show. It was a good show, and it yeah. was better because of the game, man. I'm, I think I Phew. lost hair yesterday. I mean, my, you, you don't see both Phew. both closers for teams that are all side uh, closers both give up, you know, blow leads like that. So it was a crazy game. All's well that ends well. Ben McDonald, always appreciate That's you, right. brothers. But thanks for spending the time right. with us. Always good to talk to you. Take care.